Welcome everybody. My name is Margot Field and I'm really pleased to welcome you here on a Tuesday evening in spring. I work for GP Supervisors Australia and we're really pleased to bring this really important webinar to all of you tonight on supporting your registrar in preparing for the new RCE exam. And before I get any further, I would like to acknowledge country. I'm not an Indigenous Australian. I was raised in the Gadigal land of Sydney, but now li live in Wurundjeri land in Victoria. I'd especially like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending tonight. GPSA acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we work and live and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding and respect for the benefit of the broader community and future generations. So thank you. I'd like to move on now to introduce the speaker, the key speaker tonight, who's Dr. Simon Morgan and GPSA is really lucky to have his expertise. Simon, has done quite a bit of work in the background of GPSA in preparing and pulling together uh, supervisor resource material. So thank you, Simon. Simon is a GP and medical educator based in Newcastle, beautiful Newcastle, <laughs> um, and he's worked in the medical education sphere for over two decades. Uh, he has particular interest in GP supervisor professional development, and um, he has, a bit of a, a thing for um, cycling, which I think you might pick up shortly. And he's also a bit of a muso. So thank you, Simon. Um, uh, give a bit of a pop up. Hello to Andy Morgan, who is going to make an appearance um, in helping with, with some of the activities in this webinar. Thanks so much, Margot, uh, and welcome all. Um, I just had a sneak peek and I think there's over 150 people on the webinar tonight. So that's fantastic. It's great to, uh, to join you tonight. Um, I am coming to you from Newcastle, as Margot said, on the lands of the Wobbacool people. And similarly, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and very much like to welcome you to what I hope will be a really informative webinar on the new RSCGP RC exam, which I am very aware has caused um, significant uncertainty and um, uh, a lot of people quite stewed up. The registrar is preparing for the assessment, um, trying to get their heads around this new uh, method of assessment. <clears throat> I must acknowledge, I think the college has done a fairly extraordinary job pulling this together um, and have really uh, um, had to do a lot of work in the background to, to get this to where it is. Um, I am a RSCGP examiner and I'm not here representing the college tonight. I'm very much talking to you as a, uh, a employer of um, GPSA to talk about how you as um, supervisors can most effectively prepare your registrars. And yes, Margot's correct, a cycling theme. It is the Tour de France. Very, very um, pleased that it actually made it. Uh, I do want to send a big shout out to our colleagues in Victoria and especially Melbourne who have been really suffering through a really a terrible set of circumstances in the lockdown. COVID has changed things, including this college exam, um, but it's really nice that uh, the Tour de France still was able to be run a couple of months late and I've been enjoying watching it. So yes, a bit of a cycling theme. And if that's your registrar at the end of the exam with their arms raised, breasting the tape, um, and part of their thinking as they win the stage and pass the exam is thank you very much to my supervisor. That's fantastic. So what are we aiming to cover tonight? Certainly describing the RC assessment process, this new uh, remote clinical examination um, and how it compares to the OSCE. And um, I guess most importantly, how you as supervisors can effectively support your registrar. Uh, we, we've already put into chat and we'll reference this document frequently, but the RSAGP have 
developed and continue to update their FAQs on the new exam. That's the link, it's in the chat, but you can uh, very readily Google that. I'm not intending to cover that in great depth, so please, for much more detailed information, um, access that document. And in fact, importantly, in considering what I would talk about tonight, I've made a decision not to talk in any depth about the technical aspects of the exam. This isn't an RSCGP webinar on the new RCE to examiners uh, or, or candidates. Indeed, it's a webinar for supervisors. And so also importantly, I don't imagine I'll give you the solution to ensure your registrar will pass. Now that may seem incredibly obvious, but um, I think we as supervisors take a great responsibility on around supporting our registrars. But of course, ultimately, successful passage through the RACGP barrier assessments is the responsibility of the registrar. And it can be very disappointing when they're unsuccessful, but we can only do what we can by way of support. So just a bit of a kind of sense of what we're going to cover tonight. Here's a map of the 2020 uh, Tour de France. And I guess similarly, this is the map of what we'll cover in this webinar. Very briefly touch on assessment and sort of funnel into the RACGP assessments uh, and particularly the new RCE. And I guess we'll spend the, the majority of the webinar talking about how you can practically support your registrar to prepare for that. So assessment, this is Medical Education 101, and I'm certainly not going to um, talk about too much theory. Suffice to say that assessment is a judgment. It's making a judgment on performance. And there are two broad types, formative and summative. Formative is all the things you do in practice when you sit in with your registrar and you observe them work and you give them feedback. And it's assessment for learning. It helps them structure their learning and know what they need to know. But very much what we're talking about tonight is summative assessment, assessment of learning, the barrier assessment for the RSCGP exam. And uh, I guess the only little bit of theory I'll talk about is this very well-known thing called Miller's Pyramid of Assessment. And that's, um, I nice think in some respects, quite nicely demonstrated by what looks like very challenging mountain stage from um, the tour and uh, a few peaks that you can see there. But Miller's Pyramid refers to the, um, the sort of hierarchy of assessment uh, according to what you're observing of the registrar. So you can imagine, the best assessment is at the top, what a registrar actually does. And that's true workplace based assessment, or indeed what you do when you sit in with your registrar's direct observation. The RCE and the OSCE, as you can see, possibly a little way down where a registrar's showing what they do. It's not actually workplace based, it's not exactly what they do, but it's a pretty good approximation. And then further down the hierarchy, the um, the MCQ type assessments and the KFP type assessments, which are more knowledge based and knowing how and indeed knowing facts. And so just touching on that, because I think it is important to put it into context, the RACGP exams have not changed wholesale in that the two so-called written papers, the applied knowledge test, the AKT and the key feature problem test, the KFP remain. Um, they are the same, uh, they're designed to test the same things, applied knowledge for the AKT and clinical reasoning, clinical decision making skills for the KFP. And they're the same number and type of questions, 150 single best answer or extended matching questions for the AKT and 26 short cases for the KFP. What is different about them is that they are remotely delivered um, rather than uh, registrars attending an assessment centre. But the content of the exams, I, uh, I understand, is unchanged. Um, and just for your own knowledge, again, we're talking about the clinical or the RCE exam here, but in terms of the written, um, the registrars are offered both a practice exam in their own time and what sounds slightly uncomfortable, but um, I gather it is a, a word that means invigilated, but a proctored exam, um, which is done as a sort of dedicated session where they log in and do it in time. Um, so I think a reasonably good opportunity for practice of the writtens, and they're the dates for the two um, written assessments, which you may well know, and there's certainly the registrars do. 
And I guess the third point on our learning objectives was really, what is this new RCE? Well, it's a replacement for the OSCE, the, uh, the clinical examination that's been part of the college assessment process for many, many years. And I guess in many respects, um, and my understanding is in response to the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, it's um, accommodating a very large number of candidates now um, in a way that social distancing and not bringing people together in terms of gathering is uh, manageable. It is still deemed a practical examination and the information around the RCE would say it's designed to simulate a clinical environment and patient scenarios which GPs are likely to encounter. So from that, you would take it, it's kind of like general practice, uh, but very differently to the OSCE, it's delivered remotely. So can we launch our first poll? Because I'm actually just really curious to know who is in the audience tonight. Um, so I would like you to say if you're an examiner for the um, coming exam, we'll see who you are and what you're up to. That's probably about all the votes are gonna come in. And I don't know what I would have expected, but I, I guess with lots of examiners doing the examiner training and probably having a pretty clear sense of what the exam looks like, um, I imagined uh, we would have a lot of non-examiners on who have less of an idea. So that's 90% uh, of you are not um, examining for the college exam this time round. I know a lot of people applied and a lot of people were disappointed not to uh, be offered a position. I was lucky enough to, um, to do that, to have that. Uh, and our second poll, because Margot flagged this at the, at the outset, is that, um, we may have some registrars on tonight. And so um, I would be curious to know of the 140, 150 or so, do we have any registrars in the audience? And we've got at least one, we've got a few. And Margot said, look, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a few registrars hungry for information around this and certainly may be able to then take the knowledge that they've, or the information they've gained from this to talk to their supervisors. So a handful, five of you, um, I think you ho hopefully saw that. Um, so the vast majority of you are and certainly non-registrars. Okay, so we've got a bit of an idea of who you are and, and what your expectations may be. Let's go back to the RCA versus the OSCE. Now this comes pretty much directly from the uh, FAQs and um, having done some examiner training, um, it's, it's uh, now very familiar to me and the examiners will be um, at least running the mock OSCE very soon in the, in the next week or so. So unlike the old exam where there was two examiners in almost every station apart from the Viva, there's now only one examiner per station. There's a significantly greater emphasis on case-based discussion rather than simulated case uh, scenarios or role plays. And that's a really important distinction to be made. All candidates will sit 12 cases over three separate days, which is quite a different way of, of, uh, of assessing um, uh, the, the applicants. <clears throat> um, there's a fourth day and that occurs sometime after, I think um, 10 days or so after the third, the, the three days are separated by a day. So I think it's a, um, a Friday, a Sunday and a Tuesday where the um, all applicants will sit um, across multiple Zoom based exam centres as you can imagine. They all do 12 cases and those that are clear passes pass, are successful, they don't do any more. Those that are clearly unsuccessful are not offered any further assessment. And those that are borderline get to sit four extra stations on that option or on that uh, additional fourth day. The details, as I said at the outset, I'm not gonna get into the technicalities and how it all plays out. I think you'll see all that in the FAQs. This is very much more around the practical way that you can support registrars. But I think we do need to give you some information uh, as, as to how the exam looks. Uh, unlike the old long case and short case, all cases in the RCE are equal in length, 10 minutes, so slightly longer than the standard eight minute OSCE case. And indeed there's more reading time per case, five minutes versus three minutes. So um, one might argue that the registrars have a little bit more time to prepare themselves and possibly a little bit more time to, to um, meet the objectives of each case. 
And really importantly, there's a thing called the clinical competency rubric that sort of underpins the whole RCE, which I'll spend a little bit of time talking about because I think it's a really important document that the registrars will be pouring over, no doubt, but I'd really encourage you as, as uh, supervisors to have your head around as well. Most importantly, so there are all the differences, most importantly, the standard is still the same, that the registrar, that the applicant is capable um, for unsupervised general practice in the Australian setting. That is the, the same standard that um, needs to be met. And I talked about these 12 cases, they're spread across four different types, formats of cases. And this is where I guess um, there is quite a distinction from what traditionally were viva stations or a role playing case where um, one, of the, the, one of the examiners would play a, uh, a patient. There are case based discussions which where the registrar or the applicant is given some uh, clinical information, maybe some results, maybe some findings on examination um, and there's a discussion around the case. It's not a, a role played simulated patient encounter like traditionally they have been. We'll talk a bit more about that. There are consultations with simulated patients, so the old OSCE style, although the, uh, the simulated patients um, for the new RCE will all be experienced actors. There'll be case-based discussion with descriptions of physical examinations or procedures. So the same thing, case-based discussion, but with a really strong emphasis on how one would perform a physical examination or indeed perform a procedure. So clearly you can see there's already quite an emphasis that a registrar, a candidate for this exam will need to prepare how to describe physical examinations and procedures and how they that they need to know how those things um, are done. And lastly, critical appraisal and case-based discussion with reference to a research paper. And so this is, this was always known that it could appear in the OSCE exam, but very much it's going to be part, it will be part of the new RCE. One of my tips at the end of this webinar will be teach to your strengths. And I want you as supervisors not to be spooked by that list and suddenly think, oh my goodness, I have to teach my registrar how to critically appraise a paper. I actually think that's not what this is about. Um, the uh, regional training organisations uh, do undertake that training with their registrars. Registrars are expected to know how to critically appraise a paper. And certainly if that's the strength of yours, fine. But I don't think getting across that or the need to get across it is, is, is uh, so much your responsibility. It is very much the responsibility of the registrar to know how to do that. And if you have strengths in that area, that's, that's great. But this, this station essentially will be, and that's my take on it, others may disagree, but I do think this isn't about burdening supervisors with extra need to be able to, to um, cover different aspects of practice. Um, so essentially the registrar or the, the candidate, I should say, will be given one or more research papers, which they uh, prior, a week or so prior to the exam, which they can review, they can talk about, they can um, explore uh, and then come into the exam knowing they'll be talking about one of those and often it's related to a particular case discussion. So quite a different scope of, um, of uh, types of cases compared to the old OSCE. Um, there were some questions. We put out a bit of a, uh, a call for questions prior to the webinar. And there were some questions around what practice opportunities registrars would have. Certainly there are no old practice cases, clearly, because it's a brand new exam. And there aren't, there's a limited scope in terms of what case examples exist. Registrars have been to a specific RCE uh, e exam webinar. And there is a mock RCE coming up for, for most candidates, which is where they will be taken through this. But the, uh, the specific details of those types of cases are not readily available for you as supervisors. And apart from those opportunities for registrars, similarly for the, for the candidates. 
So that's the RCE. And I guess I, I really did weigh up thinking about how I would pitch this webinar, how much to talk about the actual exam, because I didn't want to get bogged down in it. Um, and I sort of make no apologies really that that's about the extent of what I'll talk about the actual technicalities because what I want to do is talk about how you can prepare your registrar for the exam in a practical way. So most importantly, you need to know what's being assessed and we talked about the competency rubric, but I'll, I want to talk about the um, briefly, the RSEGP curriculum is massive, but there's a really much more simple document that I'd encourage you to have a look at and obviously have a sense of the domains. I want you to continue what you're doing and doing really well and that's your practice-based teaching. We'll talk more about that. Um, directing your registrar to appropriate resources is going to be part of that and we'll cover these other top areas towards the end of the webinar. But most at this point understand what's being assessed. And so this document that I'm referring to is the RSEGP Core Skills Unit document. Again, you can Google that. Uh, it's got the, there's a reference there. Um, and it's a sort of synthesis essentially of the very, very large RSEGP curriculum. But really importantly, I, I, I like this wheel, though it's a little bit unwieldy. The, the, what the registrars, what the candidates will be asked is almost uh, the majority of what they'll be asked is, starting from a presentation, a patient presents with this. So it's all, it's not disease problem focused, it's very much presentation focused. They need to be able to generate differentials. They need to be able to develop hypotheses. They need to explore these hypotheses by further history, by examination, by rational use of tests, and then they need to make a management plan, including uh, pharmacological therapy, non-pharmacological therapy, follow-up, safety netting, managing uncertainty, all those things. Now that's not, again, that's not kind of novel to you, but when you're thinking about preparing your registrar or your candidate, it's about thinking through that system. Um, and this is really very much underpinning the case-based discussions. This is the presentation. What information do I seek? How do I put it together? And um, what's the management plan? And the other, I guess, facet of this is that the college is very explicit that they're going to be examining much more broadly than clinical knowledge or the, even the applied clinical knowledge, which is domain two. Communication skills are important, domain one, but really importantly, there'll be an explicit assessment of these other areas, population health, professional and ethical aspects, organisational and legal dimensions. And again, encouraging US supervisors to think, um, how uh, can I incorporate those non-clinical domains into my teaching? So they're the domains, uh, touching on the curriculum. And I think the document that really underpins this new exam and certainly, as I say, the registrars and the candidates sitting will be using as the basis for their preparation. And I'd really encourage you to have a look at because it's manageably um, readable is this uh, clinical competency rubric. And you might think, oh my goodness, there's so many dot points, I'm getting overwhelmed here. But I think in many respects, if you look down that list, which again, I made the decision to just tease out one by one, because I think it just highlights those aspects and it, I want to draw your attention to some really important um, resources and practical ways you can actually address some of those things. If you look at that, you think, well, that's general practice. Yeah, I can see that. There's nothing kind of there that's not, that's different to what we're doing or already covering. But it's kind of nice that the competencies, which are sort of complex tasks of practice, have been documented for you as supervisors, for the registrars, and obviously for the examiners. So my intention now is just to go through those, highlight the core elements, highlight some um, particular resources and how you as supervisors can address ongoing practice-based teaching. So one may argue if you're a cycling fan that the communication in the peloton, the group of cyclists that uh, hurdle down the road 
and those that in the breakaway and certainly those that um, develop these lead out trains as they come into the bunch sprint at the end of a race the communication between the riders which is often which is very often non-verbal is as sophisticated as uh, you might see in a um, <clears throat> doctor patient consultation now that's maybe a stretch but that's why i've got that picture what what is communication again you know this basic stuff rapport building listening to the patient being able to break bad news and take a sexual history and sit while a patient's crying all those really important aspects of communication and how do you develop skills your role play your role play your role play your role play and just feedback on those elements of communication practice a tip and there'll be a tip for most of these slides that the GPSA has a thing called a communication skills toolbox it's a pretty uh, big document that but you may found it find it really useful and it's I think a particular relevance to IMGs for for um, registrars that have trained in a country where English wasn't the first language uh, and you may direct your registrar there or indeed you may tap in and see what resources you may use to help communication development the other aspect of this first one is consultation skills and that's very much how the consultation runs what the structure is how it flows and a key part of that is identifying the, pa the patient agenda and really there are um, you know the ways of doing this is the sorts of things you've been doing sitting in with your registrar if you've got uh, the wherewithal to to review video but also role play and the document that the image is of I would like to re I'm really very very excited to highlight is a new GPSA guide um, and it's on practice based teaching but with a particular focus on teaching some consultation skills so we're very excited to be able to launch this it's now on the website and if you're a registrar read it I, I really do think it would be a wonderful summary for exam prep and if you're a supervisor wishing to support your registrar similarly read it talk about it think about how you might um, touch on some of the the um, skill areas with your registrar um, that's the practice based teaching guide the second dot point under the tips the first one is is an old um, technique but I think I really do think less utilized in the Australian general practice setting than that in the UK where it was born and that's exploring the patient's ideas concerns expectations explicit questions I've taken your history and I've examined you and I'm not totally sure what's going on is there anything you're particularly worried about or um, what do you think it might be that's causing these strange headaches or you know I've um, let's let's agree on this management plan but was there something else you were hoping to get out of the encounter today so using ice using those uh, key aspects of identifying the patient agenda I think a really that'll be a key element I'm sure in the uh, in the RCE when the examiners are asking a candidate around um, uh, history taking around management planning and lastly you also may not be aware as GPSA members that we have put up a new suite of consultation skills teaching plans you'd be very aware hopefully of the almost a hundred now teaching plans on the GPSA website the vast majority of them are clinical on topics like peripheral vascular disease or <clears throat> chest pain or headaches or depression or anxiety but the new ones of which there's I think eight now are on consultation skills and I really would encourage you to have a look at these and think yes I'm aware my registrar struggles with time management or you know I'd really like to spend some time emphasizing history taking skills use these in your teaching and again or just direct your registrar to them because they're uh, rich with resources and tips and practical suggestions on how to develop these skills so that's all communication and consultation skills and we'll work our way through information gathering and interpretation this is the core of it history taking physical examination rational test ordering and clearly as you you know many good techniques sitting in with registrars role-playing these things but there's a teaching plan now on all these three things 
And what I uh, was excited to discover was I work for GP Synergy, which is the regional training organisation that looks after New South Wales and the ACT. But on their, um, uh, well, they have a, a YouTube channel, which is freely accessible. And you are able to, as a non-GP Synergy registrar, supervisor, employee, um, click on that. And it's a whole range of physical examination videos, which again, for registrars, I think a wonderful resource, because I think this is a new, important key area. Well, when I say new, it's um, always been there, but a focus on the physical examination. But similarly, test ordering and history taking. And the other thing that we've done, we just talked about all the um, teaching plans on the R uh, GPSA website. Um, we've got a new document that actually highlights them, collates them, this the educational resources, clinical topics, and it lists them by the top 30 presentations, the top 30 problems, the RACGP high risk areas, and the ICPC2 chapters. So <clears throat> respiratory or digestive. So if you want to see what is um, available, that's a good way of looking instead of just scrolling through them all. So we've communicated, we've got a consultation structure, history, physical examination and um, test ordering. And then there's this really critical aspect of clinical reasoning, clinical decision making, generating a problem list. And I think there's no better place to point you and your registrar to than the, the teaching clinical reasoning guide, um, which again, I think is a really important read for registrars prior to the RCE. But again, if you're keen to try to tap into this by helping your registrar generate differentials, by um, <clears throat> exploring and interrogating and developing their reasoning, have a look at that guide. The tip there is, a really interesting website, um, the Society for um, Improvement in Diagnosis in Medicine. It's the um, Diagnostic Error Group, basically. And they've got a little clinical reasoning toolkit for anyone who's really interested looking. But what we might do at this point is to just have a little bit of a, um, a break from the exploration of the clinical competency rubric and just put a little bit of this into practice. Now, again, I think one of the really important take home messages that I'd like to give you for this webinar is don't get bogged down on the new format. Don't worry too much about the 10 minutes and what exactly the questions are gonna ask and how many probes and prompts that the candidates are gonna get. They'll learn all that. And if you're an examiner, you'll learn all that. But for you, you're their supervisor. They just want you to discuss cases, interrogate their reasoning, help them generate a differential. And one of the really simple ways of doing that is just grab a clinical presentation, like epigastric pain, put a bit of demographics around it, like a 45 year old male who's a new patient to the practice, um, a little bit of clinical information, it's constant, but waxing and waning intensity, and then just a little bit of background information as you can read. And with your registrar, um, in our case, Andy, um, we can explore that case. So Andy, um, yep. I thought we'd do a little bit of a case discussion here. Okay. Um, you've, you've seen the, uh, the scenario. Tell me what further history you think is important to take for Kim? Oh, I think I want to know its relationship to food, yep. whether, whether it has any characteristics of reflux type pain, yep. whether it happens at night, uh, uh, and uh, whether it radiates through the back, anything like that, whether it could be linked to, you say no medication, but uh, I'd like to know whether you might not be taking some neurofen or something occasionally. Okay. Something like that. Whether there are any other associated features, any vomiting, any regurgitation, any water brush, anything like that. Yep. Um, and sort of just uh, check out red flags. Yeah, very things, good. I'm, I'm things like that. Yep. recent weight loss yep. and, and link to that and any, any vomiting with blood and things like that. Any change in his appetite, whether he's still interested in food. Yep. Um, those are the main things, good, Simon. Good. So tell me, um, I guess we haven't, I won't give you that information and we don't perhaps even have it, but what sort of differential diagnosis would you entertain with this history, Andy? Well, I'd like to 
depending on the character of the pain, it could be something like uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Yep. It might be gastri erosive gastritis or esophagitis. It could be an ulcer, um, a gastric or duodenal ulcer. Uh, less commonly, something like pancre pancreatic or less likely biliary if it's truly epigastric. And then again, much met, much less common, but just to bear in mind the possibility it could be something like a, a, an aortic abdominal uh, aneurysm or something like that, but that's, that's unlikely. Yeah, I was going to ask any, any um, non-GI um, conditions you would entertain. As, and I forgot to mention, Simon, that sort of obviously I, you want to make sure it's not a neoplasm of some sort, yep, yep. a gastric cancer or a pancreatic carcinoma. Yeah. Any other um, important uh, clinical presentations that may present with epigastric pain? Um, well, occasionally cardiac, yeah, uh, yeah, cardiac ischemia can present with epigastric pain, but it would be relatively rare in a, a low cardiovascular risk patient like this one who's only 45 and not a smoker. That's great. Well, thanks, Andy. I'll, I'll come back to you, but I appreciate your, uh, um, uh, your involvement in that case. <clears throat> I have so, a pass, Simon. I have a pass. <laughs> it's, it's not about... It's, what we're doing here is formative, Andy, as opposed to somebody... Now, yeah. what I want to do is make a very clear distinction. I am not modelling what I would do in the RSCGP RCE, which has a very formal structure. Um, there's certainly no, yes, that's great. There's certainly no suggesting uh, leading candidates. So I'm not, um, I'm not doing as I will be doing for the mock and for the real RCE. That's really important. But uh, your role is not that in many respects. And unless you're an examiner and you're really across it and you want to practice this to the, to the nth degree, but I think it's much better to do what I've done there, to demonstrate that, to um, use a case-based discussion, to interrogate reasoning, to help generate a differential, to explore, to give suggestions. Because when they, your registrar gets to the exam, they'll have that structure in their head and they'll be able to adapt to the, the formalities of the exam. Now, I'm very happy if you want to use the exam structure, but the problem is I think it is reasonably new and I would much prefer actually this more formative approach than a much more exam structured approach. What types of questions that you may see or a candidate may see in the exam are, are the sorts of ones I've asked. What further history? What's your differential? What aspects of clinical examination? What test would you order? What's your initial management plan? And when you're exploring that with your registrar, you can see in blue those sorts of things. So I might have asked Andy there, how did he come up with his differential? Does he use Murtaugh's process or a model like Vindicate? You know, what further history? He talked about red flags, maybe um, explore patient agenda in that way. Um, we'll talk about clinical examination in a little bit more, but those sorts of aspects. So very much, I mean, I would encourage you to do case discussion, which is not, I'm gonna role play Kim, with his epigastric pain, but we're gonna explore the case, but with a series of questions, history taking, differential maybe, clinical examination tests, and that will give your registrar the, 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 the framework, even with those prompting and those um, exploration questions that, that will hold them in really good stead for the exam. Let's continue just whipping through the clinical competency rubric. Number four um, is basically medication management. Um, and again, GPSA have a wonderfully uh, useful guide on rational prescribing. Um, again, I think a really great resource for registrars and if you guys haven't read it or read it recently, have a look. This will be a core aspect of the exam around rational use of, um, of medications, but clearly accessing ETG or AMH and the, from the non-pharmacological therapies, there's a very good RACGP site called Handy, the Handbook of Non-Drug Interventions, if you're not aware of it. 
Now, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, this, as you can imagine, is pre-COVID. This is uh, a mountaintop stage where the peloton's come up a steep hill. And um, if anyone's watching the tour this year, the crowds are very, very thinned out. So population health is quite different. Screening and prevention, health promotion, brief intervention, motivational interviewing. Again, there are teaching plans for these topics. Have a look at them. And clearly, the go-to resource for this is the RACGP Red Book. And so my plug or my tip would be when you're talking about cases with registrars, always think about screening, think about preventative activities, how the practice may implement them, how you may discuss those with the patient. Another really important area is on professionalism. Um, and again, there's a teaching professionalism in general practice. God, it's, it's, um, it's really nice actually putting this webinar together, looking at these competency areas and then looking at the GPSA resources to think, you know, we've got a pretty broad uh, coverage of many of these things now, which I think all these guides, which are, if you haven't read them, you know, they're 20 or so pages, they're incredibly accessible. Um, they're pitched at a GP supervisor and a registrar clearly um, will be just wonderfully rich resources for this exam. The other really good place I think uh, that you may suggest your registrar look at uh, is the Medical Board Good Practice Guide um, and also the Medical Defence Organisation resources which um, have lots of good stuff on professionalism, professional practice, boundaries, those sorts of things. Um, all right, we're gonna now just have a break for another activity and I'm keen to know random case analysis. I use random case analysis in my registrar teaching. So Jane, if we could launch this poll. Um, yes, and I do it according to the structure. I ask the what ifs. Um, uh, yes, uh, I use random cases, but no, no particular structure. No, and what notes are RCA? Because, and as the, the numbers are coming in, Clearly, there's no random case analysis in the RCE. So you might be thinking, what, what, what are we talking about? Um, the RSAGP would argue that, the, that RCA is one of the most important ways to um, prepare your registrar for the KFP. And I would argue the same thing for this RCE by um, allowing you to interrogate reasoning, to um, pose what ifs. Again, that's not part of the structure of the exam but um, such an important way of preparing your registrar for the exam. So that's wonderful. Um, half of you, uh, so that's 90% of you are doing some version of random case analysis, which is just fantastic. That is the quintessential way of exploring and identifying registrar unknown unknowns. Um, so our very accommodating registrar, Andy, is, is back. And um, Andy, I see we've just pulled up this chart on Angelo from, um, I think you saw him yesterday. Yeah. Um, look, ordinarily I'd get you to present the case, but we're running a bit short on time here. I'm just curious to know, can you, can you just take me through, just describe to me how you examined this man? What did you, do, what did you actually do? Well, um, I initially got him to lie down on the couch yep. and um, because he, he's got this persistent inguinal hernia post uh, repair pain. Yeah, yeah, so I see. Um, so I inspected his abdomen. I properly exposed the genitalia and the, and the inguinal region. Yep. And then I gently got him to do some coughing just to see if there might be some kind of cough impulse. And then I palpated his, his uh, inguinal canal very, very carefully and yep. tried to elicit exactly where he's getting this pain. Yep. And it is right over the scar. There's a bit of thickening of the scar. And then I also got him to, to stand up uh, because sometimes I think you can elicit a, a weak or a weakness in the abdominal wall if they're standing and then they do a cough impulse as well. So that, that's mostly what I did, Simon. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Um, so uh, this man, what if this man presented to you, um, uh, his ultrasound's normal, but he presents to you and he says, you know, Andy, what I'd like um, is a medical certificate, please, for when I saw you back then for a couple of days. I, um, yeah, I just, just keen, keen to get a couple of days off, please. How would you approach that situation? So I'd, I'd 
try and clarify exactly why, because this is quite a long-standing problem. So, yeah, oh, you know, he says uh, he's got a bunch of sick leave, and um, <clears throat> he actually had to go down to Sydney to um, to uh, sort something. But you know, the boss would be fine about it. Ah, oh, I'd, I'd I'd struggle with that. Yeah. Um, I, I, because I I don't think that would be professional of me unless it was a genuine reason for him to have a certificate. I, I think I. I my colleagues looking at that would not think that was appropriate behavior by a professional doctor. And so I, I'd, I'd need to query that. And I think ultimately I, I wouldn't be prepared to issue such a certificate. Okay. So how would you decline that certificate? I'd explain that, um, I, that in a sense, he, uh, if he was, uh, seen walking around on holiday down in visiting relatives and his employers became aware of that essentially as a professional person I'd need to be able to hold my head up high and and justify that that was a, a medically appropriate reason for him to be off work and and when you sign a certificate uh, it, and put your signature to, to it, it's it sort of uh, a lot of uh, society expects that to be for a valid reason and, and for you to be able to justify it. And in this situation, I feel that I, I've been sort of had erred badly. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you very much, Andy. That's great. So again, thanks, Andy. Um, and so the value of random case analysis for those who are doing it, as you'd be aware, is that you can explore the what ifs. You can take the scenario well beyond um, the actual clinical case. In this case, professionalism. So I'd encourage you to explore the domains uh, beyond the clinical. Um, but the, um, the other point I was wishing to demonstrate here is that where there's an opportunity through whatever mechanism you've observed a registrar in practice you uh, at the end of the day having a discussion about a problem patient you are doing an RCA or you're doing a formal CBD um, uh, encourage your registrar to talk through the physical examination as you just observed Andy do and obviously I've not haven't got time but you know in terms of giving feedback pointing him to the appropriate resources, uh, because that is going to be a key element of the new RCE. And again, there's no, there's no RCE in this exam. Um, and the questions I've asked Andy are not representative of what the formal structure of the RCE is, but you can see the registrar getting supported in this way is going to be able to go into the exam and adapt to the formality of the structure of the exam quite comfortably if they've had this level of uh, clinical uh, reasoning interrogation as you, um, as you prepare them. We're almost there. Uh, clinical practice systems and requirements. So this is all the kind of organisational stuff, recalls and computers and um, medical legal stuff. And again, I really do think the MDO resources, if you're not using them or suggesting your registrar look at them, there's some fantastic um, simple resources through, I'm with Avant, but I know MDA um, are another big organization and I think support GPSA. Um, so have a look and they're all readily available actually. You can see each other's um, resources. I like this procedural skills. You've got to know how to change a tire if you're uh, probably less so now than in the old days in the tour. But, um, but this again is gonna be a really important um, highlight of the new RCE that you be able, that you're able to describe a procedural skill. The rubric would talk about being able to demonstrate them and refer appropriately. Clearly, um, you know, as your registrar in practice is um, seeing and doing procedures, supporting them to be able to be competent in those things and knowing when to refer. But you may wish to tap into something like Murtaugh's practice tips. Uh, the RTOs will have their own resources on procedural skills um, and really just directing them and getting, make, ensuring, you know, talking about this explicitly, you will be asked about this stuff. I know our practice doesn't cover this. You know, we don't do many procedures here, but it's really important, you know, how to do these things. How can we support you to do that? Managing uncertainty, it's a two hour lecture in itself, but basically how your registrar can deal with um, the undifferentiated presentation. And again, there's a guide for that. <clears throat>
and lastly, I think this is Cavendish coming off his bike in a bunch sprint. Um, and that really is the moment before a world of pain and possibly a fractured clavicle and a loss of a lot of skin. Um, so the critically ill, the significantly ill patient and sort of awareness of limitations. And again, this is interesting because this isn't something we see a lot of in general practice. We don't tend to see lots of really unwell patients. And we have a bit of a sense of our registrar's competence in that. And again, that may be something that's a, that may be not a strength of yours. Um, but pointing them to appropriate resources, resuscitation guidelines, the RTOs, the, the host training organisations will have a lot of information, I, I imagine, but online resources like RACGP, GP learning. So I've just stepped my way through the 10 items of the, um, the rubric. And I did that deliberately um, because I wanted you to get a sense that those things are relatively common general practice aspects that if by breaking down, I, I've, I've paraphrased, um, but breaking them down into their core elements, they're kind of pretty achievable in terms of the, the sorts of skills the registrar may wish to develop and also highlight some of the, um, the tips and resources that you could use. So we've seen this slide before. Understand what's being assessed, know these documents, Keep going with your practice-based teaching, case-based discussion, RCA, problem case discussion, just the usual stuff, but think they've got their RCE coming, focus on physical examination, focus on procedures, you know, just step my way through those core elements of the case, interrogate reasoning, support reasoning, those sorts of aspects, um, clearly direct them to the appropriate resources. Um, uh, there are, and the registrar will know, the RACGP exam prep resources, we've already talked about those, and the mock and um, the RACGP GP learning <coughs> exam support modules. Really importantly, encourage your registrar to learn from their clinical exposure. So basically, hopefully they're doing that, but just even the most banal of sore throats, which isn't anymore because it could be COVID, uh, that I'll have to get a new example. But, um, you know, to say, what's the differential? What am I, could I be missing here? How do I manage this? How would it be if, it, if I was asked this in the RCE? And I must say, I've got somebody to thank for flagging what was a real oversight, and that is um, <clears throat> basically provision of pastoral care to your registrar. We've just had the Are You OK Day um, last week, and I've flagged at the outset that this exam has caused significant stress to a lot of candidates and registrars indeed um, and you're probably looking after these guys and so getting a sense of how they're going in amongst the rest of their lives their family and um, personal lives in this ordinary uh, you know otherwise very difficult time anyway to have to grapple with the new exam so really important aspect of what you can do i think is support your registrar's mental health and and stress levels and and um and and, and i guess connecting and making sure that they're going okay so this is our last poll and we're nearly there actually um my practice-based teaching is mainly knowledge-based. I teach mainly doses of drugs and, um, you know, the, the uh, how to diagnose a rash and those sorts of things. A mix of skills and knowledge, uh, or mainly skill-based. That's good. And I think... Um, <clears throat> so we'll end the poll and that's most of you. So I'm really pleased to see most of you are mixing it up because having worked fairly uh, assiduously on the new practice-based teaching guide, it really struck me that if there is a role for a GP supervisor, it's developing skills. And to be honest, um, how that feeds into this last slide on tips, I think is so important that um, really the most important thing you guys can do, I think is to focus on skills. The, the registrar, and this, this is from the day they start in your practice. Clearly, they, they, it's nice for them where you can walk in and say, that's pityriasis rosea, that's because of this. And they want that and that'll happen. But the more we can focus on skill development from the outset, the more in the future that's going to translate into, I think, better success in exams like the RCE. So these are my tips. These are my top tips to take away. 
um, teach to your strengths. And I think, you know, I may be getting in trouble for saying this, but I don't think I will. If you're complete rubbish at critical appraisal of, of, of um, research papers, fine. I don't think, and I wouldn't expect you to go off and upskill in that. That's the registrar's responsibility to find somebody who can help them with that. And that's because it's going to be somebody at the RTO or lots of other people. But your skills might be in a whole you know, range of uh, clinical or non-clinical uh, areas. So teach to your strengths and enjoy your teaching. Be enthusiastic about it. Focus on physical examination we've talked about. Consider the non-clinical stuff we've talked about, professionalism, legal stuff, um, organisational stuff. And I would say I really would encourage you not to get bogged down with the new format. That'll work itself out. The registrars will know how to do it. The examiners will keep them right. You should be teaching the skills. So don't worry too much. I think about the 10 minutes and the reading time and the three minutes for this aspect of the question. It's about you actually using case-based discussion, using RCA, those sorts of things to teach the skills we've talked about. One of the really nice tips is getting a registrar to document their reasoning in their notes. So, you know, uh, Andy might have put in for Kim Wu, um, if, if there'd have been a, a patient he'd seen, um, epigastric pain, query ulcer, query gourd, query, 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 ischemic heart disease, but seems unlikely because X, Y, and Z. That is a really powerful way of teaching reasoning. Get your registrar to read this rubric and self-rate and go, you know what? I don't know, I haven't got many weeks left, but these are the areas I think I'm completely struggling with. How can we support this in the little bit of time left? But obviously we're talking about future RCEs and you know, doing that with a bit more time. Using the resources that are available to you, and lastly, or most possibly most importantly, manage your registrar's anxiety and stress. And I put, don't forget travel medicine, because I was reading in preparation for this exam and was very interested to see that um, it, it said the registrars can still be asked about travel medicine, even with what's happening with COVID. So that was an interesting point. I thought I'd just add it for fun. There are your questions. I won't leave that there because I think I've read that before, um, before just before we came on and I think hopefully we've covered most of them um, although I wasn't talking about what happens if there's a power outage in the NT which I appreciate might be an issue and I certainly can't ensure that online delivery will go smoothly but that's um, uh, that's not what we're about um, from this side of things and it is nine o'clock so but I'm conscious that if you're willing to stay on and there are some really important questions to cover, Margot might hit me up with them, but otherwise, thank you. So Margot, are there some themes that have come up, some um, comments you'd like to raise? Well, firstly, I'd like to say that uh, this, is, this audience seems to have been gripped with your fantastic uh, presentation because there are very few questions and the question that I wanted well, to read is just disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, no, everybody has stayed on. A lot of people are slipping away. There was a, There is a question just gone up in the feed somewhere about uh, presentation, so bear with me while I find it. Um, for taking through physical examination, do you mean I would inspect, uh, osculate, percuss, yes. et yeah, uh, I rather on... I'm listening to XYZ findings to work down my diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. That's so, no, I think Andy demonstrated that really well. And, and, and a shout out and thank you very much, Andy, um, who came on very late minute. And, in fact, I said, do you want to know the case? And he said, you know what, I'd rather do it cold. So he didn't know what he was getting. Uh, and I think he demonstrated that really well. That's exactly what they want. It is... I'd position the patient this way, I would inspect. It's medical student stuff to a degree, but with a general practice slant, not being ridiculously comprehensive by looking at the nails, looking for splinter hemorrhages, but, you know, saying I would do these things. And also thinking beyond the, um, you know, I'd, I'd uh, think about other causes. So I might do a quick um, lumbar spine examination or whatever. Yep, that's right. That's yep. absolutely the case, Margot. Now, before people rush away, could I please flag... Oh, we yes. really would love you to uh, do the evaluation that will be sent directly following this webinar. It's very, very helpful to us. It's very helpful to the funding of GPSA and for us to know what's going on. So please look out for that. Please take another minute to do that. Let's look out for the next webinars. We've got um, one on the 20th of October on prenatal screening, what's new in preconception and antenatal care. 
with a focus on genetics and reproductive carrier screening. Uh, that will be an awesome webinar on a topic that uh, is just expanding in general practice in terms of your involvement as GPs. 5th of November is a really boutique one for supervisors observing your registrar and our lovely role play doctor, Dr. Andy Morgan, is actually um, presenting that one on the 5th of November. We've been running a series on chronic disease management and health assessments and teaching your registrar. And on the 24th of November, we have another one on that. And coming up in December, we've got one on really cultural and spiritual aspects of terminal care, um, optimising the experience of the dying and family. Uh, Dr. Annetta Malone will be joined by another speaker who's yet to be um, uh, pinned down. So look out for those webinars coming up. And uh, yeah, all our webinars are put up on the website. So um, you can always look at ones that have already occurred. They are a great resource. It's important for us to also acknowledge that GPSA is supported by the Australian government in uh, provision of its funding. So thank you to the federal government um, under the AGPT training program. I want to say a big thank you to all of you uh, supervisors who really are building the future of general practice by doing what you do so well. I'd like to really say a very big thank you to Simon who's put together uh, an amazing uh, resource in this webinar in a time where people just really want that information. Um, Simon, as I said earlier, has had quite a bit to do with the other resources on the GPSA website teaching plans and guides. So please have a look at those. They are awesome and incredibly importantly, you do not need a password to access any of our resources. They are freely available. So you don't have to go, oh gosh, I'm a member. What's my member number? What's my password? No worries, just go on the website and find them. Um, so thank you and thanks very much to Dr. Andy Morgan who put himself on the line tonight, go you. So. I don't think there's anything else we need to cover, except no, thank, thank you for you. your time and yeah, energy. Thanks so much, everyone. And um, you look, it's uh, it's been a stressful time for the poor old registrars and, and other candidates, mm. and um, some of that will be coming your way. So good luck um, preparing, and I really hope this has been of some value. And, um, and please, uh, browse the website, have a look at some of those resources, and you may be really, I mean, not just for exam prep, obviously, but you might be really pleased about how you can incorporate those into your teaching. Mm. Um, yeah, and we'll look forward to seeing you at an upcoming webinar. Yes, thank you, everybody.